So I'm going to um, start off by introducing uh, Willie Wilson, who uh, was the project uh, discussion leader uh, for the Brockton Public Libraries Vote Project. Willie is a teacher and scholar, and he's also the founder of the Frederick Douglass Neighborhood Association in Brockton. And uh, what you ought to know about that reading is that um, it's multilingual. So they read uh, Douglas's speech in all types of different languages and just another reflection of why the Douglas program is such a great grassroots program. So really, it's good to see you today. Well, same, glad to be here. So one of the things that impressed me about Brockton and I actually came to the library and met with Pat on the night of one of the events was y'all had like 50 events planned. I mean, it was just an amazing amount of activity. And I know that you participate in a lot of these as a discussion leader. I thought what would be interesting for people to hear um, from your perspective is, as far as the subjects that you all talked about, what really stood out to you as maybe the most complicated topic? And what surprised you in the response of the audience that you guys talked to? Because I think it's really important for us to learn about how these projects, you know, landed in, in your community. Um, well, I think uh, one of the most complicated subjects uh, we, we did, uh, we had over 70 events. We had a film series and so forth. As scholar of the program, I was responsible for identifying and uh, presenting a, uh, a piece on black suffragists. And uh, I think one of the most complicated uh, parts of that was explaining to the general audience that uh, even after 1920, after the 19th Amendment was passed, uh, the fact that uh, one of our local uh, in the town of Easton, uh, a community that abuts Brockton, uh, we have Blanche Ames, and she was very involved, and uh, we did a special film and a play about her, and uh, there were several Brocktonians, uh, women who were involved in her group. But after the, the, the legislation was passed, uh, people went on with other things. Blanche Ames then went on, and, and she uh, was involved in birth control, the birth control movement here in Massachusetts. And there was a failure to understand that millions of African Americans still uh, did not have the vote because of Jim Crow. And, uh, and so uh, I, I think uh, people uh, tend to think historically, oh, oh, it was passed, check that off and move on. And uh, also the, the complicated web of involvement. Uh, when we started, we had initially had identified about uh, 75 black suffragists. And uh, when we finished, uh, there were over uh, uh, 325 uh, that identified. And again, working through Alexandria, uh, uh, that organization. So I think that was the uh, one of the most complicated things. And, and, and the audience responded in kind in terms of asking more questions and uh, why didn't we know about this? What, how, why was this left out in history? But then you said, uh, the other question you asked, what surprised me? I think what surprised me was the level of involvement. Uh, we had to shift quickly to Zoom and uh, we were still able to have the film series. We were still able to do a lot of the talks and the debates. And uh, what surprised me the most was out of state involvement. Uh, men and women who clicked on to view our program. We had one woman from uh, Texas who actually drove up here. She was so impressed with the, the various presentations that she came here and, and met the mayor and, and met leaders on the uh, on the council. So that, that kind of surprised me. But uh, I, I do want to say the, the one piece that we were not able to do uh, was the uh, involvement of uh, Brocktonians in the movement because I couldn't access the, the library being closed. I couldn't access uh, special documents and, and microfiche and so forth. And so, uh, and even then, we're still going to continue that later. Uh, so uh, a lot of the facets to the project are still continuing. And, and lastly, I want to say, uh, one of the things that disappointed me in general is uh, before we got involved with this project, there were various websites uh, that were uh, uh, designed to involve young voters. 
uh, and a lot of those uh, were gone. So they were just temporary. And we're hoping that um, through this project, we can identify those and try to get something that's more permanent. Thank you. I think what you said about uh, people's understanding of the larger struggle and that it do it never really ends at one point and with one piece of legislation is, is really important and something I think we'll keep coming back to this afternoon. Uh, I wanted uh, actually to, to talk to Kathleen Nutter about that because um, Kathleen uh, is our um, independent scholar who worked at the Forbes Library in Northampton on their Right to Vote series. And what I thought was really fascinating about that work was um, that Forbes chose to really have a through line and look at what happened with the 19th Amendment, but also look at Jim Crow and the voting rights of 1965, look at incarceration and citizenship issues that fa people face today, as well as, and I think they were the only organization to tackle this topic, but is one that we should keep in mind, the understanding around teen voting, which is happening at the local levels in some place. Kathleen, uh, for you, uh, what was it, what was the process like in choosing um, those those subjects? Because I think that they seem to fit to me really, really well. But but I wonder just what the process was like there. And maybe for you, having had them side by side, you know, in multiple events, what did you take away from some of the contrasts or comparisons of the histories you looked into? Well, it, um, I really would stress from the outset that it was very much a group effort. The librarians at Forbes. Uh, Lisa Downing, Molly Moss, Julie Nelson, um, and es essentially my, I guess she was kind of my handler, Faith Kaufman, um, were fabulous to work with. And it was really, we sat in Lisa's office. Um, we met, um, this is in January when you could still do that. And um, we kind of, um, you know, and, and everybody's like throwing ideas around. Well, obviously we're gonna start with women's suffrage because that's, you know, it's the anniversary. And um, discussion around how that program would go, and then well, what next? And civil rights, the civil rights, the modern civil rights movement seemed the natural, you know, follow up to that. Uh, and we were fortunate to have, um, well, it was three UMass Amherst professors. One of them, John Bracy, actually participated in the movement um, in the '60s when he was, as he said, a little younger. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and then um, we shifted um, in the fall to really um, very, um, there had already been such talk about the, the barriers to voting, including um, past or current incarceration, um, language issues, uh, gerrymandering, you know, all that. Um, and we had um, a great panel there too, including um, the um, state rep for the first Hampshire district, Lindsay Sabadosa. And then um, I have to confess, they, um, I mean, they did just seem to flow. And then that fourth and final panel, which was only like a, a week or so before the election day, uh, was um, Kelly Brown, who's a government and history teacher at East Hampton High, and um, seven of the most incredible um, activists, high school students, high school activist students, um, that um, uh, spoke. Um, argued for, uh, and, and they also presented some of the arguments against. They were they are a debate team, so they were trained to do that. And it just seemed, seemed to flow uh, in a way uh, that was um, organic. Uh, even, and uh, I, I think um, it, was, it was ending on a positive note, um, you know, in a week before an election that was so fraught. <laughs> Uh, already uh, and um, still is in some ways um, we, the consequences of it. So um, I think it, it it flowed really well, uh, and I'm I'm very proud to have been a small part of it. Tell us something from that last conversation that stood out for you as far as a teen's perspective on voting. Well, it was there. Um, it was really the, just their um, incredible enthusiasm and, you know, wanting, you know, seeing this as, um, you know, the, the right to vote um, as something that is, um, should be exercised. 
that um, and even if you you know you move out of state, you go to college somewhere else, and it gets complicated uh, with your registration. You, it's it's people. You know they they had the sense of the history that people died for this right, and you know men, women, white, black, and it was um, you know that they should honor the, those past efforts and sacrifices um, by exercising, you know, a pretty sim hopefully not too complicated process. Yeah, it really shouldn't be as complicated as it is. <laughs> um, and I, I think that's a conversation we can have today too. Um, I, you know, speaking of complications, I, I think this relates in a different way to, to um, our, our, our next panelist, Deborah Lake Fortson, who's the co-founder of Tempest Productions. Uh, they were funded for a project called Soapbox, Soapbox Suffragists to create and produce a theatrical performance around the struggle for women's right to vote. And so that is a complicated subject, but I think the complications I'm interested in, Deborah, are you had planned to travel this production and then COVID happens, it would be interesting to hear, you know, how you all shifted gears and what that meant for um, the work, I think, and maybe your insights onto the type of work that you all do. Great. Um, yeah, so, boy, it was an incredible year for, for shifting, <laughs> shifting everything. Um, so the project started out to be, ideally, a, uh, this is what we thought it was, a pop-up project. So it was going to be done in public spaces, um, partly because we wanted to be doing that, and also because we wanted to reach a wider audience. And there are lots of people that never go to the theater, and they would never go to a symposium, and they would never even go to an online, um, you know, educational thing. But they do go for a walk in the city. So what we were hoping was to snag them with some bits of text and some images and some um, fanfare and things going on that would illustrate and, and have in them really meaty stuff about how vigorous and how exciting the language of these suffragists was. So we thought we would bring some like portable soapbox like things and climb up on them wearing period dresses and start talking. And um, so we were all really excited about this idea, although working outside is really hard in itself. Um, and the idea was to select some speeches, both from African-American suffragists and white American suffragists, and try to connect the dots between the ab abolitionists, um, the suffragists, the civil rights workers later on. We were very ambitious, and um, in some ways, we never would have gotten to the civil rights era. Um, but uh, of course, what happened was that we were meeting with a group of um, four black women, two white women who were reading texts and trying to select what we were gonna do. And suddenly we weren't meeting <laughs> and the country shut down and uh, theaters shut down, public spaces shut down. So um, we, uh, hold on, let's see if I can scroll this up here. So we moved to Zoom. And by June, I thought, well, this is going to go on for a while. And I think we should just, you know, take a rest <laughs> and not do anything. And my own instinct, I'll have to tell you, was to just get under the covers and stay there until it's every, the all clear sounded, right? But I called Lee Heald because we had scheduled to do a performance with the AHA Festival in New Bedford. And she had already changed the platform completely for the festival. So it was all going to be virtual. And she said to me, just pivot. So I said, okay, okay, <laughs> we'll do it. <laughs> and uh, my partner, Mary Jenkins was all for it. She said, look, this is the year of the suffrage. Uh, it's happening now. There's incredible things happening with the voting. You gotta do it now. So we had to change completely our um, structure because I didn't wanna come to a dead halt, but we, so we sort of kept going looking at texts but we needed a new format, new audience type, new skill sets for all of us, um, because these are theatrical performers. They're used to having an audience. <laughs> They're used to having people on stage that have bodies that they can respond to. And now from this sort of big focus, we were going outside to get a big focus uh, of drawing in people who were just getting off the subway, you know? And now our focus had to be this little green dot and we had to sit still because if your head wobbles while someone else is talking, you can't, they, they are going to distract, distract from them. So it was a very, very different performing skill set. 
even for people who had done television before. Um, because even in television, there's real bodies in the space with you. Anyway, we decided to take a closer look at two texts instead of so many speeches and trying to talk about a whole era. Um, and we took Susan B. Anthony's Is It a Crime to Vote, which became the title of the piece. And as the election season progressed, her words of fury against one part of the population trying to prevent another part from voting became and are continuing to be extremely relevant. It was kind of astonishing to be working on it. Her, her voice is very aggressive. It's very changeable. It's, it's quite wonderful. The second piece by Ida B. Wells from her essay, How Enfranchisement Stops Lynching, suddenly sounded chillingly contemporary when George Floyd was killed, of course. And our sessions were very emotional. I mean, there's, there was also this bond being formed between this group of black women and white women. Some of us knew each other before, um, but we'd be, we'd be crying reading these texts. Um, uh oh, I better not cry now. <laughs> Anyway, what we decided to do was instead of one performer on a text, which boy, if you try to listen to these 19th century sentences and there's only one person speaking and you're on a video screen, you're not gonna listen very long. It's the, the prose is too complicated. But we discovered that in the prose, there's kind of a call and response um, structure where the writer sets out one argument, then they go back and they, they argue against it. And then they argue for it again, or they set out a list of things. So it has already multiple voices within the text. So what we did was we had each speech read by several people, a main person, and then a kind of chorus. So it's ending up to be Greek theater for television, you know. Um, but this kind of variety where you augment the different um, sections of the speech with different types of voices, I think this kind of works. So we taped this tape with excerpts from the works and discussion. And um, what happened was, to, and going back to what Willie said about how people don't know about uh, how black people lost the vote, um, we didn't know either. And the details of that are pretty amazing and horrifying and fascinating. And our scholar, Khabibi Max Shelton was in part of the broadcast. She became part of the broadcast and she, um, it educated us, <laughs> you know, started feeding us things to read. And she um, also said, you know, we need to put some history into the tape because she said, I'm teaching college students and they don't know what happened after reconstruction. They just don't know that history. And it's very, um, it's, it's, it's astonishing the history, you know, the, the whole thing about the constitutional conventions where they, they stood up and said, okay, the purpose of this convention is to make sure that black people don't vote. That's what they said. They didn't say it in those exact words. Anyway, um, so we put together a tape with some scholarship in it and the readings, and we sent it to Lee in New Bedford and she broadcast it in August at the um, AHA Festival. And she said that she thought that more people saw those presentations on the tape than would usually come to the festival. And as, um, I think Willie said too, you know, people tuned in from far away who wouldn't have been able to drive to New Bedford, um, but they got to see it. So that's kind of an interesting clue to how we can reach people in a different way than, than we used to be able to. Um, our other venues that we had talked about, we had scheduled to do it in Pittsfield and they closed down. They just said, see you next year. Um, Hibernian Hall in Roxbury was closed. The park was closed. Um, we, we had discussions with Chris Cook early on who runs environmental public spaces in Boston. And at first they were talking about, you know, well, if you had a few people, if you put circles on the ground, if people can, but we thought we, we don't wanna be trying to manage the audience with a, with a thing that's out there live. People always wanna come up close to actors. So we just said, no, can't, can't go to the park. Um, all along this process, we were talking to Jennifer Hall Witt, which, who was really wonderful, supporting us and encouraging us, you know, saying yes to everything. And also with full of suggestions about where to send the tape. And so that, that's been going on. Um, I, I don't know if you want to hear about disappointments as you were asking other people the same thing. 
<laughs> um, well, I think that uh, I'm glad you, you know you mentioned just everyone involves awareness of history um, and, and and how it has to how it had to grow in order to do the project. And you also talked about you know constitutional constitutional conventions and other aspects of that history. And I think what was interesting in 2020 was that history itself became part of the political debate. Mm. You know, it became radicalized due to particular voices when it came to trying to either suppress or access the vote. People were turning very visibly um, to history as a place um, of reckoning and as a place where we could either find common ground or even take things to a more polarized um, uh, framework. And, you know, at this point, I think it's also good to, to talk to, uh, to our scholar today about the larger arc of American politics, because I think that particular aspect of the dialogue and, and the debate over the last year was interesting to me as someone who studies the public humanities. Um, but I think just looking at that larger context is, is, is good and, and, and certainly hearing, I think, from you all your feelings on that, too. So I'm going to welcome now Kay Lehman Schlossman, who serves as the J. Joseph Moakley Endowed Professor of Political Science at Boston College, where she teaches courses in American politics. Kay is also the co-author of the award-winning Unheavenly Chorus, Unequal Political Voice, and The Broken Promise of American Democracy. Kay, it's been really good to get to talk to you already as we've been preparing for this event. And I think I'm interested today, um, first of all, in your impressions of what you've heard um, from, you know, people who have been really doing some amazing public facing work. But secondly, and, and maybe you want to start with this, what's remarkable to, from your perspective of about this time when it comes to the public's interest in voting rights and in that history of American democracy, because it does seem like the last year has been a moment there and you have studied a much larger arc. What, what stands out to you that we should know about the larger public conception of voting and, and the ballot box? Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me here. And it's been a pleasure to meet you all and hear about the inspiring things that have been going on with regard to these grants. Um, let me quickly respond just spontaneously to some things I heard. So when Deborah said, just pivot, all I could think of was that 54 weeks ago, I thought Zoom was a, a verb that meant to go fast. <laughs> and I got sent onto a platform I'd never even heard of, much less used, and I've been teaching remotely since then. And so I had to just pivot too. And Kathleen, I was very struck by your talking about the high school students and how engaged they were with the right to vote because one of the things we've known for a long time is it's very hard to get younger people to the polls. And it would be really striking and important if there were some turnaround on that. Um, and, and one of the things that political scientists talk about when they talk about turnout is there are some real reasons we want high turnout to engage the public in the electoral process and so on. But the other thing is that inequalities of turnout often map onto differences of preference. And since in this day, younger voters have diff on average different preferences than fogies like me, um, it makes a difference whether there is differential turnout. And we haven't really focused on that as much with regard to age as we have with, for example, especially race, but also class. Engaging younger voters is a good sign if it's more than the students that you talk to. And when Willie mentioned it was passed, check the box, move on, he was putting in a much more aphoristic terms something that we've learned about the history of enfranchisement going back roughly a century and a half and or almost two centuries. And that is, and I get this from a book that I would highly recommend to all of you. It's very readable. It's by a historian on the faculty of the Kennedy School at Harvard. His name is Alex Kasar. And it has <coughs> the memorable title, The Right to Vote. <laughs> And one of the points that he makes is 
that, oh, and by the way, I gave this book to my father when he was 97 and he read it and thought it was great. <laughs> um, but one of the points that he makes is that what do you learn in high school about the right to vote? That we've had successive enfranchisements. First, we um, enfranchised white adult males without regard to um, property ownership. Then we enfranchised um, black males in the South after the Civil War. Then of course we forget that we then disenfranchised them in the 1880s, 90s and aughts. We enfranchised women in um, 1920. We enfranchised 18 year olds in the early 1970s. So what you learn in high school is it's this triumph. We've em embraced a larger electorate. Mm. But what KSAR shows is that at the same time that we have enfranchised new groups, we have also been simultaneously in the business of disenfranchising. Often through uh, mechanisms that don't have the names of groups on them, but that make it harder to vote for particular groups. The disenfranchisement of African-American men in the, in the post-Reconstruction period with the introduction of Jim Crow and those constitutional conventions that were just mentioned is one piece of it. A little later at the same, at, but roughly simultaneously, there were a series of other um, measures that were meant to clean up politics because politics was dirty then. And they were stuffing ballot boxes and they were finding ballot boxes in streams and so forth, were, were a series of measures such, for example, um, registration of voters that had a, um, the implication of disenfranchising or making it sufficiently harder to vote that especially class-based groups were less likely to go to the polls. So in a sense, our electorate expanded with immigration in the late 19th century, but it contracted on a class basis as a result of a series of reforms. And one of the most important reforms was the Australian ballot, which meant that you could vote in secret and you couldn't be punished because publicly, you know, your ward boss knew who you voted for and so on. But one thing that I didn't know until embarrassingly late was that one of the implications of the Australian ballot is that you have to be literate to vote on a, on a ballot that doesn't have pictures of parties, it has names of candidates, and you're doing it in secret. And so there was even then a kind of mixed implication. One of the, the things I want to point out about the enfranchisement of women in 1920, on the one hand, it came awful late, but on the other, there really hasn't been any backlash since. That there haven't been attempts to disenfranchise um, women per se since then. I don't need to tell you that we're in the middle of, of um, another phase of the voting wars. And one of the things that's quite striking about the voting wars we're seeing this week in Congress is how explicitly partisan they are. They've often had partisan and group implications in the past, but people code it in terms of a concern about the integrity of the voting process or equality among voters or whatever, even if there are partisan objectives involved. I have never heard as explicitly partisan rhetoric around the vote as we've been hearing this very week. And if others have questions about this, um, I'm happy to talk, but I don't want to take any more time. So I, I want to talk about that. And I also want to uh, welcome uh, Mayor Robert Sullivan of Brockton. I'm so glad to see you here. We met at the library uh, when things kicked off back in February, and, and I know you were really supportive of that project. Absolutely. Thank you, Brian. It's great to see Professor Schlosman, who was my professor back in 92 at BC, poli sci. So good to see you, Professor. I'm glad you're prospering. 
<laughs> Proof of your impact, Kay. Um, so this is that's an interesting point, I think, that there's this partisan focus to it, because what you all have talked about, I think, is efforts to exclude particular groups. You know, African-Americans win the right to votes. There's an ongoing push to push them back out the door. Um, different immigrant groups have come in and had to fight to have that access. Certainly women had to fight that they had to fight. But to actually have it feel in some ways like each side, and particularly maybe one side, is trying to force another party to almost be illegitimate in the voting landscape seems unique. When we think about the America that we know today, which is increasingly, uh, you know, a majority minority nation, there does seem to be a demographic shift that is driving this push to exclude more people from the vote. Okay, I'll start with you. Does that make sense to you as a, as a sort of framework that what we're seeing is a partisanship that is really responding to the fact that essentially a, a dominance uh, of um, a white population over access to power is, is not, no longer has numbers. And so these obstacles are being put up in order to prevent what I don't want to say is inevitable, but what is certainly a certain demographic change. Let me think about that. Um, um, I mean, one of the things that I always teach when I teach parties and elections to, to undergraduates is I, I say, I have these rules about the rules. And one of the rules about the rules is the rules of politics are rarely neutral in their political effects. Yeah. And that disputes over procedure usually mask some kind of disputes over substance. And as I said a minute ago, what's really remarkable about this past week is how much those disputes over substance have been right out there on the floor of Congress. And one thing that's unusual about our era, you've mentioned one, which is an important um, change in the racial and ethnic um, constitution of the, of the electorate, but we are at a point where not only are our parties extremely partisan and far apart, and there are lots of ways to measure that, and they all say that our parties are further apart, that party loyalties are higher, partisan voting in Congress is, is higher and in the state legislatures and so forth. All those measures say we are more partisan. But the second piece that doesn't always get as much attention is that the parties are balanced. So that in a in the post New Deal period for a long time, the Democrats kind of ran things. And so the Republicans to get anything out of, you know, any policies that were congenial were forced to compromise. And what's happened in the last two to three decades is that the parties are now relatively balanced. And so they have much less uh, incentive to compromise and they have more incentive to fight to the death. We also are in a situation where um, the distribution of where the Republicans are and who support the Republicans and where the Democrats are and who support the Democrats has shifted in such a way that there's some geographical consequences. So we hadn't had for a very long time until 2000, a situation in which the, the candidate winning the plurality of the votes did not become president. And that ha happened again in 2016. It has to do with the fact that they're, that the electoral college, you know, uh, benefits small states, and those small states have have an advantage. Or the Republicans have an advantage. Um, a circumstance which a partisan characterized as um, constitutional welfare that the Republicans are living on constitutional welfare, but there are structural characteristics that give Republicans um, some incentives to, um, to worry about the arrangements. Mm -hmm. And we began before the 2016 election and especially before this contested election in which a quite substantial plurality of voters and um, uh, voted Democratic, but 
a plurality of Republican voters think that the election was actually won by Trump. And they believe that sincerely. Um, but going back to the, to the aughts, Republican dominated legislatures began to vote um, for party ID uh, at the state level. And um, the question that I would say to your question, Brian, is was that, deliberately racist, or was it that in a variety of places, the most obvious democratic voters are black? That the probability that a black voter is going to vote democratic is much higher than a random white voter in the same, in the same jurisdictions. So was it, a, was it racially motivated or partisan motivated? We can't really figure out but that was a very quick way for a party to try to disenfranchise um, voters who weren't going to vote mm -hmm. in, in their direction. Well, um, you, you want to say something? Okay, Kay, I was wondering if you could speak to uh, voter uh, repression now. You know, like you said, you know, you know, was it overtly racist or were they just trying to get to that group? Could you, could you speak to the various voter repression measures? And I think, you know, if, if you could sure. add a litmus test to, to those, because okay. I think some of those are just out of the box races. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Let me say that the last decade or so, we think about the measures that um, make it harder to vote. But there have also been measures, including in Massachusetts, that make it easier to vote. A number of states, for example, have extended early voting. Um, and we know that with, with respect to, and um, something called no excuse absentee ballots, a number of states have that. You don't have to say, I'm going to be on a business trip in San Francisco, and so I, you know, I can't pass my ballot in person. Um, and so there were movements to make it easier to vote. And in some of those same states, there were also movements to make, you know, uh, measures to make it harder to vote. And let me talk a, a little bit about some, what some of them are. One of them is requirements for purging voter lists. And on the one hand, we don't want dead people on the, on the voting list. On the other hand, we know that the computer programs and the matches that they do um, are very imperfect. I have a bunch of very unusual names. And when I went into the social security office, I found that there were mistakes in my social security file. And that's one of the bases that states can use to, to um, purge voters. And uh, blacks actually tend to have names that a lot of people have. Um, and so they are more likely to be purged through um, a per, you know, a voter list purging pro process. A lot of states allow you, if you've been um, eliminated from the, the rolls, to cast a ballot provisionally. But then it's a pain in the neck. You cast your provisional ballot, you got to go to town hall within the next two weeks to verify it. And so the proportion of uh, ballots that actually get, um, you know, verified is relatively low. And that is falls disproportionately on Blacks. Um, voter ID laws, which in the, in the earliest manifestations were seen as trying to make sure that there was no vote fraud. One thing I want to make clear is that political scientists haven't really been able to figure out how much voter ID laws make a difference, but for who can vote and so on. But one thing that they have established and that we didn't know when they began to be approved by the courts was, um, was how much vote fraud there, there was. Mm. And there have been a lot of studies since and say, no, 
the kind of vote fraud that a voter ID law is meant to counter just doesn't happen very much. Mm -hmm. Why doesn't it happen very much? Because committing the kind of in-person vote fraud that having voter ID um, is meant to counter means you have to commit a felony in front of your neighbors. Sure. How many people are going to do that? <laughs> and so um, whatever you think about this last election, in terms of that kind of vote fraud, yeah, there just weren't those kinds of irregularities. So yeah, I, I, we aren't so sure what it means for the outcomes of elections, but we know that the that the compromise of voter voter integrity that it was meant to, to counter just isn't a problem. Um, I'm going to jump in here um, yes. and encourage everybody um, if anyone has any questions uh, for the group to drop them into the chat because we have a little bit more time left. Um, and in that spirit of, of, you know, a kind of final question here, I think um, what stood out to me when we began uh, the process of opening up the, 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 the grant for the votes is we're in Massachusetts. And for the most part, uh, there is a, you know, pretty dominant political party there. There are, of course, issues around access to the ballot box that by no means can be um, ignored. But we are in a place where, you know, uh, there's um, pretty secure voting. And when we think about projects like these, what we're hoping with the humanities is to be able to inform people, not necessarily tell them to vote in a certain way. And in fact, that's sort of one of our requirements is, you know, do not advocate for a particular party or platform. But for Willie and Kathleen and Deborah, and, and you know, we only have a little bit of time, I guess just any reflection you have looking back at the project that you completed and what you felt it did to contribute, I think, to a healthy democracy. Because it sounds like each of you do, does feel like, first of all, this work is important because it does make a change. And the engagements you had with the audience are very, very important. Um, so given that it was also a year of, of, a, of unbelievable pressure on our democratic system, you know, tell us one thing maybe that stands out for you that you feel like, yep, that was, that was something I'm really glad we did in a really difficult time. And I'll start with you, Kathleen. <laughs> um, well, I think, you know, I'm, I'm a historian, women's labor historian by training, so I can't, um, I'm not gonna trash the, the first two panels we had because they were, they were the history. That was, that was the setup. Um, the history of women's suffrage, the fight for that, and then the civil rights movement. Um, and, but I, I think it was really, those, those second, the, the third and fourth panels that we had, uh, that they were in the fall, um, that um, really, um, you know, the current barriers to voting and to talking about the youth vote, um, they were just so timely. Um, and so um, there was that, um, you know, especially with the, the barriers to voting, uh, that was, um, I, I quoted from a Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, decision in one of the, um, forgetting the, um, the case name, but it was the one that really um, tromped down on, on voter rights. And, I, I, and she had only died like a few days earlier. And I had to say, I'm gonna try not to cry, but this is what Ruth Bader Ginsburg said. Um, and uh, it really, uh, we had, um, some great feedback, you know, and, and questions in the chat, um, you know, pushing us on, um, you know, the barriers to voting, um, and then the response to the youth vote. Um, I think those, you know, I know you asked for one, but I'm doing two. Uh, they really did, um, you know, engage um, our audience, who I did, like, even in theater, you know, we, I miss work in the crowd, so it was, that was uh, one piece, but just, you um, getting the current issues out, which have a historical background. Um, sadly, <laughs> they're still with us and in some ways even more intense. But I, I really do hear that because I think that libraries serve that function and you guys 
continue to do it anyway, which is to say we have to create space for those types of conversations, even within this very radicalized landscape. And I think that's what it sounds like you all were doing, particularly with those last two. Um, Deborah, I'd love to hear what you think, especially it, from a perspective of, of, a, of a theater artist and, and what theater can do in a moment like this. Okay. Um, well, one of the things that happened with us is we, I, I was interested in what Kathleen said about the young people because we got allied with a project at Central Square Theater in Cambridge called The Vote. And uh, that was propelled a lot by the group that they have called the Ambassadors, which is a group of young actors. And they did a play um, about voting that was extraordinary. And they did it um, on an open air stage called the Starlight Stage that uh, Central Square and MIT and I think a couple of other organizations, they built an outdoor stage. It, it's a great place. It, um, and the audience had to sit far apart, but we were all outside. So people were able to go and see this play. Um, so that inspired us as a group to think about ways besides the project that we were taping, how could we get some of this information out there? Um, as I said before, we were just kind of thunderstruck by what we didn't know when we started the project. And, we, and I think I came out of it thinking that education is the most important thing to do right now. And that what can we do to engage young people on Zoom, on, um, on materials that might come into a classroom, but maybe they have to be more sexy, you know, and they have to be more like jazzy to get people to watch them. These kids are used to watching all kinds of graphic craziness. And um, I don't know what would get them, but uh, that's an exploration I'm interested in. What we did, because we're not uh, tech savvy like that, we went outside again and we chalked the words of this um, electrifying paragraph from the Ida B. Wells on the sidewalks. And it's a pretty long paragraph, pretty complex. And we did it in connection with the Central Square production. So the, the text snaked along the sidewalk and led you to the theater. And mm -hmm. then um, people would stop and ask us what we were doing and we would tell them. Um, so that actually generated a whole new project, which is called Ida 2021. And it's going to be chalking on the sidewalks with some women out there in period dress, walking and talking and looking at the text and talking to each other. And we got a small grant from Cambridge to do that outside whenever we can. It'll be probably late summer or early fall. Um, so that's kind of morphed into a whole different project that's really a spin-off from this project. That's really exciting. That's really, really exciting. Willie, for you, um, and I think specifically for people living in Brockton, though I know you had people um, come from everywhere, what, what stands out to you is, is what really mattered um, in the larger struggle for doing these kind of projects? Uh, the engagement of our youth. And uh, fortunately, we were able to get one panel in. Uh, we worked with uh, uh, a, a teacher at the high school uh, who... Uh, had his group in the African American Club, and they they uh, had a presentation. We brought in speakers, and then they did various projects. And uh, and uh, one student she wrote a, a, a wonderful poem. But uh, at least we, we you know once we went Zoom, we didn't have all the students together. But just that spark was enough to keep uh, several uh, elements going. And uh, again, you know, thanks to our committee with Pat Monteef and Paul Ingle, and uh, we had Amina Pilgrim and Miss Belcher and, uh, and Catherine Honey, we were able to uh, kind of steer things in terms of keeping uh, 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 Greg Hazelwood, who was the teacher at the high school, involved. Uh, and, and so that was a thread. But uh, uh, again, that, that involvement of the youth um, was, was critical. And uh, and getting back to something that uh, you know that Kay said, you know, I, I'm I'm concerned. I would like to see uh, something permanent in terms of, regardless. I I just feel that we're a better democracy, we're a better republic, when everybody who's eligible to vote votes, and and I would like to see some. You know, I mean, we have 50 states, and so there are best practices in terms of of doing eligible you know, whether you're doing fraud or, uh, you know, so why don't we look at those, 
but I, I think there should be some kind of federal guarantee. And personally, I find it reprehensible and degrading in this day and age when people from the southern states every few years have to ask for the reauthorization of the voter uh, Voting Rights Act. You know, I, I just think that it's despicable. And, uh, and I'm hoping that through all of this, there'll be, uh, you know, we'll get to a point and, 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 and the cards, let the cards fall where they may, you know, but everybody who is eligible to vote should vote and, uh, and should be protected to vote. And I, I think that's a federal guarantee that that should be uh, enforced and made. And, and one of the other things that came about as this project, uh, when I was teaching U.S. history, I, I stressed then years ago the importance of the Reconstruction era. And, and, and most history teachers, U.S. history teachers, you know, you're forced to move right along. And boy, has that come back because it, it parallel, there are many parallels to what we're going through now. And, uh, and that voter, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, just think if, if we were able to marshal the federal government didn't turn its head, it, 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 you know, if we were able to deal with things then and we wouldn't have had to deal with them 100 years later in the 1960s. Uh, and so we're at a pivotal point, and 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 this vote, the Garrett, the right to vote, and the voter suppression. I think people need to be, uh, when they see it on its face, they should they should just be re repulsed, you know, because again, it's another way of restricting individuals. Agreed. I think we're just at about time. We have two questions. I'm going to merge them into one. I'm going to limit it to about two minutes, and I'm going to throw a huge challenge at Kay. A question about, and I think this relates to everything Willie just said, because this does seem like a pivotal moment, and we just talked about three organizations who did important work at a very pivotal time. One question is about voter turnout and how to, you know, ensure that it grows and the other is that is bigger what are the big structural like is the structure of our constitution and democracy no longer equipped to deal with what we have to deal with so the two minute challenge is k if we work from the presumption that there is a critical moment here what is the big idea that you've heard that you feel like one would really bring radical change in a, in a positive way, if we can call it that, and two, may have a glimmer of hope in the next 10 years. That's a tough one. Well, I'm gonna change the conversation radically to say that the way we tinker with procedures, for example, we know that one thing that, that enhances turnout is um, same day registration. That's the one that works best. It would make a marginal difference. What would really make a difference is that we know that the best predictors of who goes to the polls are education and income, especially education. And um, that has implications for turnout on the basis of, for example, race and ethnicity. But it's not being black that depresses the turnout of blacks as opposed to whites. It's the fact that educational and income levels for blacks are, are on average lower. So if I were to recommend a change, it would be a social structural change mm -hmm. that would bring greater equality and higher levels of education rather than having fights about tinkering about the, uh, you know, how we do. And there are a lot of things that are going on today that do depress turnout, like closing all the places that people vote. <laughs> Or moving voting, you know, so you don't know where you're supposed to vote, even though for the last two decades you've been voting at one gym, now it's a church. Mm -hmm. And nobody told you about it. But to be honest, if I were to do something about turnout, it would be to bring around greater educational and income, uh, to reduce the educational and income inequalities among groups in the And that's a big change. So we'll hope to be able to stop this sort of Kafkaesque craziness that's going on at polls, but also work, I think, for the structural change that you're talking about. And I think that's well put. Bridge Street friends, if we were all together, I would ask you to applaud uh, these four individuals. This has really been a fantastic conversation. 
Thank you, Willie, Kathleen, Deborah, and Kay. Uh, we do have um, more great things coming up, and and and, and I always want to thank um, my colleague John Siraki, who puts these together because he does an amazing job. Thanks for showing up. Um, we will follow up. I think that um, John is um, creating a video for this and to make sure that you all are able to keep track of the work uh, that these four do, because I think it's really, really important, as you heard today, that we don't think of this as a one stop and we move on from the issue, but that we continue to read and reflect and engage in these types of public humanities programs, no matter what the format is. And Brian, um, I, I want to see, see, I, I haven't, uh, you know, uh, Kathleen's program and Deborah's program. Is there a way all of us do different grants and we're involved in different localities within the Commonwealth? And many times we miss the other things. One of the things you did, which was great with the Frederick Douglass, you brought everybody together. I don't know if you remember that. We met in Lexington. That's and I, and, and I, I would love to, you know, some of these things are fantastic. And, and you know, I, we, I think our students would benefit, but our localities would benefit as well, seeing some of these other uh, projects. 100% on the same page. Um, I got a board meeting tomorrow. Um, at which time we will approve a new strategic plan. And I'm sure we'll be talking to this group about this, but I would say to you, Willie, this vote initiative, as well as that Douglas convening, really drove home to us the need to have some focus in what we do and to bring grantees together to have that kind of conversation and to share you know, your practices. And the other thing that's baked into that plan is to make sure the whole world, or at least the whole Commonwealth, knows about what you're doing. And so I think you'll hear stuff from us, but we're going to continue to listen. So, I, I, you know, we'll be back in touch with, with each of you, I think, as we continue to plan that out. But good things are to come, I think. Okay. And, and Kay, could you uh, put in chat, or somebody put in chat, the book you mentioned? Because you've referenced that before. And I, I really, uh, on voting, uh, Alex uh, Kasman, uh, Kasak, I, I hey, you sir. know. I'll do it. How do you spell it? It's a great thing. Yeah. And in the chat, Willie, is a link um, to uh, the Forbes library. Oh, yes. I copied all that down. Yeah. So uh, would there be a video of uh, of that? Yeah. Oh, there's okay. the four videos are, are up still. Oh, good. Um, John, did you put the in the chat the video that you asked me about before the meeting? Yes. Yeah. Oh, good, good. I have that too. Oh. Okay, great. And we do have a page on masshumanities.org backslash the vote where there's links to both the projects that had happened and some of the, the things that we're talking about in here. And I think we'll continue to add stuff on as you guys send us links. And and I know uh, I'm going to send you a, a few books. I know this the one that Kay referenced just now is so important. Alex Kazar, yeah, the right to vote, but I, I'll send you, uh, I'll send you that in an email because I know you had mentioned you were putting together a book list. Great, great. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, have Thank a great you. afternoon. Talk Thank to you, you soon. You. Thank you. Good job, Kate. Okay. <laughs> uh, Thanks.